Hi, Sudha. Welcome to our uh, show where we interview amazing women like yourself who are uh, doing uh, wonderful work in the field of AI and other emerging technologies. So thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Swati. This is so exciting, you know, I've been waiting to talk to you for so long, so. <laughs> likewise, likewise, I'm glad that finally our schedules matched. So I see you're very inspirational because you are doing some amazing work, uh, whether you're teaching at Stanford Continuous Education or teaching at Barcelona University. So I wanted to understand your career trajectory. Looks like you have technology background and so on, but um, talk to me a little bit about how you got started. How did you move into the world of autonomous vehicles and AI? I'm one of those people who has had many, many careers, I should say. Uh, I started out uh, as a computer science uh, engineering uh, graduate, and it was hardware and software, and it was, it was, was pre-iPhone, pre-Android, pre-anything cool. That is how, you know, antique I am, I should say. Uh, but I have seen many waves in the technology industry and it comes and goes. So Correct. I didn't know that when I got started, I wanted to learn computer science, started in, you know, wanted to write device drivers. That was where I did. And um, then I got excited about this thing called the internet and web and what is possible. And uh, I got an MBA uh, and from Boston University thinking, hey, I'm lacking the business knowledge. Now I'll become a business person and apply my technology knowledge to companies. That started my career path. And uh, what I ended up doing was I moved out from the programming job to product management. And then I started moving progressively to different roles because I wanted to learn um, how a business operates. You know, I was still in the technology industry. And so bulk of my career for the initial part, I was in product management is how I would say. And then I came back to product management at a later stage. But the further I moved away from um, technology, actual coding, uh, I missed technology. So at some point I had grown in management and I was responsible for building you know, entire uh, business uh, solutions uh, and technology kept shifting. So what I had learned had all become data. Mm -hmm. There was this world of platform. And I remember, you know, when the world of wikis came here, we could write onto a remote site. How is that possible? You know, that was kind of an intriguing thing. So at that point, I made a switch back. And, and since I had been a very data driven product manager, I moved towards the world of platforms. And, and that was the the next wave of it. Somewhere along the way, I've done a startup. I don't even want to talk about it. This was pre-iPhone, pre-Android world, mobile middleware play, uh, building the app store, which was, mm -hmm. you know, uh, during the, the dot-com era. Um, I uh, landed in this whole platform world right when Facebook was launching mm -hmm. then in 2007. And uh, I got very excited about it. The one thing that has actually helped me in my career uh, pivots along the way is I'm very driven by passion mm -hmm. and I don't ask for permission mm -hmm. I don't even apologize after the fact mm -hmm. I just show results and I've learned to do that repeatedly mm -hmm. and when you do that a couple of times you will get confident about it so when I so I had you know uh, worked in big companies was product manager became director of internet solutions at one large company and then um, left everything when did my startup and then I took a mommy break and then I came back to this platform world. And at that point, it gave me a new perspective to look at, okay, now I can go to start to a startup world. I can, you know, go back to a big company. Here are all these possibilities. So I decided I'm not going to do either of this. I'm just going to go figure out what I want to do. And I ended up creating multiple meetups. So at one point in Silicon Valley, I ran the Facebook meetup. I had started the Twitter meetup, Pinterest meetup, Google Plus meetup. And I'm a big believer of this whole grassroots energy of people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. teaching each other. And I've done a bunch of fun projects by the side, but I was not making that into a bigger startup. Right. Um, so at that point, um, because I was in the developer world and running hackathons and stuff, PayPal called me and they were launching their platform. So here I was somebody who looked geeky enough and was in the developer uh, world. At the same time, I had a resume that I was adult enough. 
And so <laughs> they ended up inviting me to come in and help them shape that. <clears throat> I was very, very passionate about social media and social <laughs> platforms at that time. And I still am to some extent. <laughs> so um, I basically said, I'll come do this in developer network. It was created as part of the engineering organization. I said, my only thing is I should be called social media strategist. And I thought that was like a big coup because, you know, I thought it was- a That deal. time it was a big yeah. deal. Yes, 2009, I think I went to pay. pay. Right, right. And so uh, we use social as a listening platform to talk to developers, to build out our platform, essentially talk to product management on what features and support that uh, developers need to help shape the, the growing of the platform. And then I stay, and then I, I ended up getting excited about data and social data and I did social data mining. I actually have a, a, a patent on this Twitter data mining uh, at that time and they gone. And then I moved into eBay, which was uh, part of PayPal. And eBay mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So uh, I moved back to product management as a social commerce PM for eBay. And then, um, it was an interesting exercise because it was e-commerce and again, using data and I was obsessed with data. And then I started working with our internal analytics organization. And I said, give me an analyst to help with uh, my work on social, uh, social. And they said, we don't have a uh, social analyst. Uh, I said, okay, give me a analyst who knows SQL and, and Tableau and everything. And I will teach them social. And then I kept getting more and more of the analysts. And at some point, um, the head of the all analytics orgs there, uh, VP came to me and said, what's your plan for next year? Because you're asking for a lot of people. And I, and I gave him this big spiel of how social data and how it will help social commerce and what my grand vision was. And he said, would you come and build social analytics in the analytics org? And I had never worked in analytics. And, and by the time I'd moved away, when my identity wise, I'd moved away from technology because I was on the business side and I was this PM. And so I didn't even blink. I said, sure. And then, yeah. and then I ended up creating the social analytics function. And then that, you know, took me for another six years as part of analytics. And the funny thing is in eBay, uh, analytics was owned by finance. So this was reporting under the CFO's org. So the mindset was very different. And mm-hmm. very soon my boss figured out that, okay, social is too less for how much money it's making for how much money we are paying you. So we need to give you something bigger. So I ended up doing a stint at the office of the president for a year where uh, I built out whole uh, scorecard to create transparency using data of how $70 billion was made at eBay mm-hmm. and collaborating across you know, 65 different analytics functions. And then I ended up in that, in that journey. Um, I basically get bored after some time if I'm doing the same thing, if I don't have interesting problems to solve. And we so, have a lot of parallels. <laughs> <laughs> so, we yeah. have a lot of parallels. I started off as an engineer. Yeah. I did product management. I went back to engineering. So, so many interesting parallels. I'm just listening to you. I also started a meetup group uh, here yeah. in Unfortunately, I'm stuck in the wrong wrong coast. <laughs> but fortunately, now I work on interesting problems with the government. But the thought kept coming to me, oh, my God, so similar. But you ran an amazing analytics division for eBay. So I can't so, match that. <laughs> the interesting thing from what you said is um, I was actually based out of Boston for many years. And I had the same thing. Am I stuck in the wrong coast? <laughs> so I shared that too. And I'll tell you that, uh, you know, now being in Silicon Valley for like more than 10, 12 years, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't and matter. and the pandemic sort of normalized it, right? It matters and doesn't matter because especially with Silicon Valley startup, you had to be. People were relocating there. But yeah. the pandemic has sort of demystified that, I feel. And also, you know, that I, that is, you know, some of the choices we make or our experiences shape uh, our belief system, I would say. So um, for me, when I moved from, from Boston to, to San Jose, um, I just thought, hey, I'm just moving within the same country, right? And it felt like, a di- and I was in technology industry, but it felt like I was in a different world. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I worked for a bi-coastal company, SunGuard, when they opened, and it's, the energy is different. The people's mindset is different here. It's very conservative because I'm in DC. 
but I had to, you said we, we live by our circumstances. Now I have discovered there's a lot of value I can add to government agencies here. Yeah. So, so I found that uh, because of that, I'm kind of always um, um, paranoid about not limiting myself with the Silicon Valley view because it's good. We are very innovative and we don't ask permissions and, you know, take mm -hmm, mm -hmm. good, right? And so the kind of people I hire every time I'm done at a certain plateau, I feel like, okay, somebody with a fresh perspective can come and scale this better than me. Because I'm a very big believer that things happen in companies in innovation because of people. And people are, are motivated by their passion for whatever they're working and their individual aspirations. So exactly, yeah, the, exactly. Uh, Those like, are the, gone yeah. are the days when money drives it. It's all people, what excites me today when I wake up and yeah. uh, given X and Y dollars are being paid, what is the differentiator? It's only my excitement and itching my curio. That's the other thing which uh, you said, uh, which is interesting and I want to underscore that. Don't ask for my permission and repeatedly produce excellent results because Women always ask me that thing. And for me also, that has held true. So I really appreciate you bringing that to highlight. Repeatedly perform, don't ask for permission, just go ahead without hesitation. Yeah, and the thing is you have to set a very high bar for yourself. Correct. So for me, I am accountable to myself and my bar is higher than what any boss would set for me. Correct. You know, so that kind of drives me. And then, you know, after, if you actually tune in and see any time, any job when they hire you, they're looking to solve a problem. Once mm -hmm. you solve that problem and earn their trust, they are looking for you to bring your creative ideas to say, how can you shape the business? What kind mm -hmm. of products can you build? What kind of markets can you reach? New kind of campaigns, any function, right? They're looking for right. We are all like knowledge workers. So they're looking mm -hmm. for our ideas. Mm -hmm. But if our ideas are uh, supported by our past results that we've learned, earned trust, Mm -hmm. are supported by data and logic and mm -hmm. buy-in from our, you know, our other peers who we respect, then we can keep moving. So, you know, I've always been you know, lucky to work with super smart people and I kind of try to go and put myself in the middle of people smarter than me. <laughs> so that- We can, learn from them, right? We have yeah. to do that to learn from them smarter than us. So, yeah. oh my God, there's so much to unbox here. So then we've only touched the tip of the iceberg. So talk to me a little bit from, uh, from you know, providing um, analytics for, uh, for eBay. How did you move then into the autonom autonomous so, vehicles? Uh, one other, the, the, the last role I did at eBay was head of mobile analytics, uh, which was a $27 billion business. And the way I, I fell into it is uh, I sat in this big uh, meeting with a lot of SPPs and talking about budgets. And there was this conversation saying, you know, the mobile team um, doesn't seem to be driving mobile growth. If the market is anyway going towards mobile. And so- yeah. Why are we funding them? How should we deal with that? And so I, I volunteered and I said, I will do a project and find you empirical data whether mobile is cannibalizing our business. And so I went and, and, went and uh, found out uh, with multi-screen analytics that the customer hops across desktop and mobile. Mm -hmm. And we were at that time, mobile was $17 billion business, which, which means iPhone, iPad, Android, and mobile mm -hmm. version happening was 17 billion. And it, they had this projection that it was going to go past 20 next year. And 75% of it was cannibalizing desktop business. 25% mm -hmm. was new money. And so I went to, went to the management folks and said, I could build an analytics org that would actually create transparency on this and help optimize this so that we can actually get more money out of that. So by the time I left, it was like $27 billion business. But it was an amazing experience because instead of just analytics and reporting, suddenly it became very strategic because this was a part of business that was part of every country manager's growth plan. And so right, and it's I, affecting the top line. Yeah, so I was supporting product managers. That is what my team's core function was. But then we had to work with, uh, and we were part of the finance org, so we had to kind of, you know, come up with what our growth numbers would be with every launch of, uh, of apps. But also we had to support various different regional heads on whether they will meet their numbers from revenue 
because of a product we will release. So it's kind of a nitty gritty product feature you're seeing that is going to impact some kind of dollar amount mm -hmm. in a country. It's, it's just mind blowing. So mm -hmm. it was a lot of smart people of variety of different backgrounds. So in that exercise, anything that was considered mobile was you know, sent my way right, and, uh, with my team. And so wearables started coming and that kind of came my way. And eBay gives us a sabbatical after six years and says, okay, go take a break and come back. And uh, so that was coming. So I started thinking, what do I want to do? My, I had no plan of leaving my corporate job and I was just thinking, I'm going to go back, but I wanted to write a book and I want, I started thinking about it. And I realized wearables was not, was just one part of IOT, not everything. So I ended up writing a book about IOT that kind of mm -hmm. took my, my sabbatical, but I never went back. And that kind of took me on this new trajectory of being the technology futurist where I realized what I have was not, um, was not the whole world, right? So um, I started interviewing people on my YouTube channel called the IOT show and uh, that became my my new path. So I ended up writing, you know, uh, more books and with case studies, Stanford called me to teach uh, at the continuing studies department. And then I, I stayed on and then from social, I moved to, uh, no, from um, um, IOT, I moved to uh, autonomous vehicles. I can tell you that story separately. <laughs> yeah, but that's a, that's a seamless transition because Autonomous vehicles is that convergence of all this IoT sensors and AI and vision and everything. So that's awesome. Oh my God, so much to learn from you, Sudha. So, so inspirational. So, so let's talk a little bit about your, I think then once you got into autonomous vehicle, since it uses AI. So, so talk to me a little bit about some of the exciting projects you've worked on in the whole AI arena autonomous vehicles, ethics, et cetera. Yeah. So um, one of the things I realized uh, compared to my corporate job towards the end and what I'm doing now is I, I enjoy learning. And mm -hmm. I keep doing the same thing in a company. You stop learning. You're mm -hmm. limited by what the company is doing. So I'm very particular that I don't want to stop learning. So what right. I'm doing, now I also teach, right? So what I end up doing is um, I operate in kind of two input output modes, I would say. So I'm constantly uh, having a path of something I'm researching. I'm a technology futurist. So I'm looking at, okay, there is all this hype around so many different technologies, especially I fell into IoT and IoT became this catch-all bucket for everything. And so I wanted to know, given that I have managed growth, what would I bet on and say, hey, this is going to be here in the future. So I wrote this book called IoT Disruptions 2020 about what the world of 2020 would be and how do we get there? And I did not predict COVID. <laughs> but Nobody could predict <laughs> that, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> so that was one. And then I looked at the car as just a, a, another IoT initially. And mm -hmm. given the data background, uh, the, my focus is on value creation from data. So mm -hmm. I was teaching a course at Stanford for professional adults like you who want to go change the world and, and learn the latest in IoT and, and AV. And usually my students would say, okay, now I've learned this. Now I realize this is much bigger than what I thought. I want to go apply this in my company and I want to do more. Where do I go? Mm -hmm. And I, I offer a very unique dimension to my, my content or teaching is since I came from an engineering background and then I moved to the business side, I hover between in, in the gap between mm -hmm, mm -hmm. business and uh, the, uh, uh, technology. So because of that, I teach people who are business people, product managers, all kinds of roles to learn technology and value creation from data and, and how the ecosystem is shifting and how you create business models. And so I had students who are all these different roles who apply what they're learning from autonomous vehicles and how that will impact their industry and not just limited to transportation. And so that is one. Um, I recently, like la early last year, I started this course on AIX, which is about designing for mm -hmm. UX designers. Need to be in the game when we are designing with AI. Mm -hmm. it's AI is defined, uh, uh, done by data, but UX designers need to be involved to define the persona of robots, mm -hmm. whether it needs to have a persona, how do you build trust with the AI? All that is design thinking, and then it came again. And right. I started researching that, and I found some gaps, and I ended up writing my book called AIX. Mm -hmm. And so I teach a course on that. Um, and 
I think thanks to work like people like you I, and uh, a few others, I would say Mia Dan, uh, uh, Susanna Raj, a whole mm -hmm. bunch of people um, inspired me to think about this, that I cannot be just teaching about value creation from data and doing jobs. Um, I need to teach people about the ethical side of things. Mm -hmm. So recently I started adding modules on ethics mm -hmm. and then I, I teach uh, AI ethics as a, a topic at Barcelona Technology 3 in three of their uh, master's programs. So that's my contribution to ethics. There are brilliant, amazing women and I've seen only women in AI ethics. So I would not you know, even claim that I'm doing anything in AI ethics except that I'm just being responsible with what I'm, I'm getting people excited about by teaching them about AI. So but you bring my... that diversity of perspective, right? Like you said, you hover between, I like how you put it, you hover between business and technology. And I say, I connect the dots between business and technology because we've had similar career yeah. paths, but that's amazing, amazing. So, so tell me as a technology futurist, I would love to know your thoughts is uh, where is all these convergence of emerging technologies headed because there's IOT, there's AI, there's autonomous vehicles, which brings everything together. So what are some trends that you foresee in the AI ML 2021 and beyond? And uh, I can go on record since this is going to be recorded. You can hold me accountable to what I'm saying because I do my homework before I, I talk about these things. So one is I'm doing some interesting uh, research work on AIX. If that's interesting, people can connect with me. And anybody here, if they want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I will find time to, to reply back and, and talk to you. Um, the other thing I'm finding is uh, AI is now everywhere because there's data everywhere. So mm -hmm. I look at IoT as just uh, adding connectivity and, and um, producing data. Mm -hmm. And then AI is where we are building knowledge from that, right? Mm -hmm. So that AI is kind of become ubiquitous. And autonomous vehicles actually is not just about the AV, but the path to autonomous vehicle is making the car into an electric car, a connected car, and it's, it's challenging the business models of how we are going to have ride share or some kind of shared mobility. Mm -hmm. So there's so much to do to unpack that. So if somebody wants to get into that space, it's never too late and you can come from any industry, any kind of job function, and there's something for you to do to shape that so we can get to that mm -hmm. uh, autonomous vehicle space. So I've written this book called 2030, The Driverless World. So that's my prediction of when we will get to see real autonomous vehicles. But one thing that happened with this whole COVID reality of last year is we got grounded, we lost mobility. So we have an appreciation of mobility. Mm -hmm. We also have an appreciation of, of uh, not uh, sitting in traffic, not having to go move to, we love working and meeting mm -hmm. colleagues, interacting with people, mm -hmm. but we don't enjoy that uh, idea of just driving and commuting in traffic and creating, mm -hmm. uh, driving in gas guzzlers and polluting the environment, all that other stuff. So it kind of made the, the world to some extent stop and think about good and bad in, uh, in how we are living, right? Mm -hmm. So And then it added a lot of connectivity. There's so many cameras watching us. There's so much connectivity to, to remote devices because we're accessing everything remotely be because of that. So now we are at an interesting phase. Now, when we go out, we have a change in behavior. We are more, more receptive to technology more than mm -hmm. before. We have so much more data and there are questions of, you know, what is our privacy boundary of what we will accept or not. Mm -hmm. So that is all shaping a new world. It's not just the technology. Technology is just a enabler. I, yeah. You work. stole the words from my mouth. I <laughs> always say that technology is an enabler. And yeah, and, yeah, and COVID just expedited uh, embracement of technology in multiple, like fitness, nobody wants to ever go to a gym again, right? For $12.99, I get excellent classes in my home. So, <laughs> so amazing, amazing. I know, we have this telepathy going on, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> So one thing I would say, if you're looking at what the future is, where to focus on, uh, since I, I believe that the gap between business and technology, uh, when I say technology, I'm talking about the, the data scientists, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the people who are actually bringing the money and focused on the customer as their daily job, right? Various different jobs, it could be mm -hmm. business analyst, it could be you know, business development people, marketing people, product managers, anything, right? Designers, anything along the way here, focused on customers, 
or you're focused on building the product, that gap is widening more and more in every possible technology. So one of the things that I'm looking to uh, do is to uh, cater to people in that gap mm -hmm. and help them uh, learn AI in a simple way. Mm -hmm. But I also don't believe that you can't learn technology and just be a strategic leader in technology. I believe you need to learn the, the crux of uh, technology in a fundamental way. So mm -hmm. I have this new thing called Business School of AI. And if you're interested, you know. That's super exciting. Thank you for doing that. And uh, I'll be showing you more of what is possible uh, in the coming um, two weeks, I would say. Uh, meanwhile, um, I would say if you're, if you're interested in pivoting your career, I, mm -hmm. a, I believe you have to look at what you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you're already a mid-career professional or somewhere you're already out of college and you know, into a workforce, you have to leverage your experience of what you are bringing. And that mm -hmm. will land you better salaries, more interest, easier to get jobs, I would say. So um, think about if you want to solve a problem or you already work in a specific industry, Mm -hmm. or you're passionate about specific technology. Those are three different paths to pick. Mm -hmm. And within that, you ask for my prediction, I would say natural language processing with the chatbot. That's huge, that's huge. huge. Very easy to learn and get involved for anybody. Uh, computer vision with all our cameras watching mm -hmm. us. Uh, facial recognition on the uh, you know gray area of ethics uh, is one. So that's the, the other piece. And then there's machine learning with data, mm -hmm. right? So. Uh, I I would say voice is exciting, but I'm not betting on voice to be the next thing in 2021. But these three, I would say general machine learning, NLP, and uh, computer vision is three I would bet on. And there is this whole uh, area called no-code AI. Mm -hmm. basically, you know, Super they, exciting. Uh, H2O, driverless AI. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've, I've been teaching a course on um, online. I have a site called Driverless World School, which is going to morph into this Business School of AI. So you can check Driverless World School if, if you want or come to uh, Business School of AI. Um, I have te been teaching this course for business professionals to learn how to build an AI without code. And mm. it's not just, the, it's not just the, the semantics of a tool, mm -hmm. but starting a business problem, working with a real industry pa partner. I have this thing called Capstone AI Lab. Where mm -hmm. have a real industry prop partner comes in and says, here's a problem I want to solve for. And a multi Very similar to universities. Like I'm doing two capstone projects with yeah. the universities here. So, yeah. so awesome. that, that's where I came from. Since I came from, you know, uh, teaching, I thought if we can get a capstone project. But typically capstone projects are not done by uh, the non-engineers, just a bunch of business people. This is business people who, are, who have years of experience in their industry are going to look at that and the quality of product they will produce. They'll actually help drive strategy. Using mm -hmm. And they can take it back and you know implement and it in the their company, own lives. Yeah, the company is going to own the data, the company mm -hmm. is going to own the solutions, but the students are going to learn how to do no-code AI in that process. And we're doing that with multiple different kinds of data, different kinds of problems. But I'm more passionate about uh, not giving things in a prescriptive way. And I'm not going to say this is the steps you follow to get into AI or this is the step to follow to build NLP. I'm I'm a believer that we all are very creative inside and we mm -hmm. bring the combination of experience that we have. So when I'm looking at 2030, the driverless world or where autonomous vehicles are switching now towards trucking and some kind of uh, multimodal transportation towards mm -hmm. uh, working with transit companies, um, I'm thinking of our AI, bringing AI innovation into different roles and companies. Uh, there's so many different paths. So I like to get my students to understand the, the gap between mm -hmm. the and business and figure out, okay, here's the business problem. How do I translate that to a data science problem, like a problem statement? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are the different ways to do that? What are, what, how is it possible? You know, how do I get the data wrangling do, uh, done and, and feature engineering without me actually being the data engineer? And how do I work in a multidisciplinary team? How do I define business metrics so I can get you know the right performance out of the AI? That kind of thing. And then their path is their own. What they are going to go do in their companies is going to be different, and that's going to help shape that companies and, and how AI would work. So I would say NLP, um, computer vision, machine learning uh, on the AI side, and definitely come to autonomous vehicles and focus on the data.
the focus mm-hmm. is connected car and digital twins in in the in the vehicle and focus on if if that's your sweet spot what kind of business models can we create test the mm-hmm. business models like it's a product and see right. the assumptions in the business model and it's a, it's amazing place it's a great time to get into involved with autonomous vehicles i would say with the focus on the connected car and it's a great time to get into ai in many of the areas that i spoke about and i'm happy to help come find me at business school of ai absolutely i mean this is uh, i mean we covered so much ground i can i can only imagine how much uh, in depth and breadth your school would be so absolutely i would recommend everybody to at least check it out uh, linkedin with suda so thank you again suda this was awesome amazing you bring a lot of energy to this talk and i really appreciate your time today and look forward to having you back maybe once you release your uh, business school of ai i have amazing students i'm always bragging about my students because they're going and doing amazing things so uh, i host something called uh, weekly wednesday which is a free session mm-hmm. for my school community so if somebody is interested i'm always sharing that on uh, linkedin also they can come drop in we would try and give preference to our students so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i have a lot of you know student alums who are from every possible company and so and we also have a, like a global mix of students this is not limited to silicon valley i have people from brazil from nigeria from germany from everywhere. that's amazing it's an international business school <laughs> yes so my my aspiration is to build this whole lab concept out in the cloud mm. it's not tethered to one particular location correct actually figure out you know what's happening in industry and it's easier now right with due to covid people are used to it like you don't need to travel anymore and so much more acceptable and accessible so thank you suda thank you so much for your time again and best of luck with the business school of ai thank you so much swati i had so much fun and i look forward to the follow ups and i promise i will respond to everybody who connects with me on linkedin or come back check out the business school of ai i will at least give you guidance if you are looking to career pivot or or figure out any of these areas for for where you want to innovate or working your career thank you so much thank you bye